We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and this is going to be a lot more reacting to the news of the week than it is going to be our predictions for Saudi Arabia, but... Oh my God, we have a lot to talk about, and we do, you know, we do. So it's it's so much. It's so and it's much. only week two of the season. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm I'm overwhelmed. I'm just gonna put that out there. I know. I feel like there's been a lot of stuff, but again, like taking a step back, it's all bullshit, <laughs> and none of it matters. <laughs> yeah, but. It's still fun to talk about or exciting to talk about, whatever. It gives us something to talk about. Um, Yes. Taking a little little bit away from the race, but we did just race last week. So it's not like we've been on a break for a long time, but it seems like we have been because of how much has gone on this week. But woof. Yeah, the the fact that it was Saturday that we had the season opener in Bahrain, like, and it's Wednesday, and it feels okay, like a also, month of news has broken. Yeah, like, having the race on Saturday completely threw my weekend. I was so convinced, like, the next day was Monday, and then I had a yeah. whole extra, like, bonus day of the weekend, it felt like, <laughs> even though it was a normal weekend. I kind of don't hate the Saturday races. I'm not going to lie. This Saturday morning, I didn't like Vegas being so, so late. Um, yeah. Fortunately, I Vegas this year will be better, timing-wise. thank God. But no, I, I'm, not, I'm not hating these Saturday races, so. Yeah, it, it also definitely threw me off a little bit. Fortunately, once we get through this weekend, we will be back, fortunately or unfortunately, whatever you want to call it, we will be back to our Sunday race day routines um, and – cool it's um we just there's there's just so much going on yeah so let's get into it because we do have a lot to talk about and doing us we'll talk even longer about it so yes also that um so so yos (laughs) yos for stappen let's let's start there stappen daddy for stappen um uh, i don't even know where to start with this because it's just a chaotic mess. Um, yeah, but he's skipping this so, weekend. Yeah, he's 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 not going to be in Saudi. Um, whether or not it was actually based on the statement he made about you know if Christian Horner stays, then Red Bull is going to explode in a you know great fires of hell, etc. Um, but he he is not going to be at Saudi. Um, but I. Also, I, I understand that Jos Verstappen has a um, outsized influence over his 26-year-old son, Max, who is a three-time world champion and, and an adult. Like I, and I understand that with his rather unorthodox upbringing, that Max and, and Jos Verstappen have a unique type of relationship. Um, but what I also want to ask, and I don't know if this is an answer for you or this or this is an answer that we need from people who have been in the sport a little bit longer than you and I have, is why are we taking Jos Verstappen's word as gospel? Because so, everything that I've seen is no, is that he's he's incredibly unreliable as a narrator of what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, I think honestly... It's not to blame the media, but I think it's just a soundbite that's entertaining yeah. and they know it and everyone's jumping at it because, like, we will believe anything that people put in front of us. Um, I I mean, I don't take it as gospel because I know he's, for lack of a better term, kind of a crazy. Um, but, yeah, I don't believe any of it. I think he's just you know, talking and a little bit jealous of his son and trying to be relevant again. And all this is just culminating and turning into this mass chaos that is so unnecessary, such a distraction to the team that's not needed, not warranted. Um, And honestly, I don't care what Yopes has to say. Like he's so irrelevant in my F1 story that I don't care. And it's just annoying that we're giving him so much attention. Like we're talking about him now. But obviously we have to address it because it's been just 
a lot this week, but I don't know. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, you know, this is not the first time that he, like I said, that he's been, you know, skipping a Grand Prix and, uh, you know, he, he wasn't even there in Qatar last season when Max clinched the championship because he was, I think, racing in, in rally car. Um, but, but like if he's there or not, who cares? Yeah, it, it, exactly. It's, you know, he, he there, there could have been plans that he was never going to be there anyway. Um, I understand that it's easy because it's all, you know, in the same, you know, geographical location, but everyone's also making a big deal that like Jerry Halwell Horner is not going to be at Saudi Arabia because she doesn't go to every race. She goes to the big ones. Um, and as we know, Jeddah is not my favorite race. <laughs> no, mine either. Yeah. Um, either. But before we get into to Jeddah and, and Saudi Arabia, we do have to address these rumors about Max Verstappen potentially leaving Red Bull in 2025 and going to Mercedes, which we didn't want to talk about this and just kind of wanted to ignore these rumors because they're dumb. But then, you know, because of the fact that Lewis Hamilton left to go to Ferrari and no one believed those rumors and they turned out to be true, well, then anything could happen. So now we do have to talk about this. We do, but we don't. Like, I, the last thing I want from this season is to be talking about stupid seat rumors all season long. I know that's what's going to happen. Fully, fully aware of that. But Lewis has, like, triggered this domino effect of, like, okay, now we all we can do is theorize and rumor mill the shit out of who's going where. And it's going to be such a distraction from the actual season that it makes me so annoyed. Like, who cares if Max goes or not? Like, good for him. That's great. But let's just wait for silly season. We have a month, three weeks for it. Shut up about it now, please. My anxiety can't take it. But also, I, I don't think this is true. Like, the Lewis to Ferrari thing, I think, makes more sense. Everyone mm-hmm. wants, like, I generalize this. Don't yell at me for saying this. But, like, everyone wants to drive for Ferrari, right? Like, it is at least the Ferrari of old. It's very historic. They have lots of deep roots in F1. Being a Ferrari driver, like, is held on the pedestal. So Lewis, at the end of his career, not happy with Mercedes, whatever, he has the chance to jump to Ferrari and maybe win some races, maybe not. But he knows that he's going to make a huge impact there, talking about, you know, working with his foundation and changing the culture at Ferrari a little bit and working on diversity. And, like, that means so much to him him talking about the sport, being, you know, an advocate for the sport, a champion of the sport, I think he'll be able to do some great things at Ferrari. That move is completely different than Max going to Mercedes, especially in the state that the car is at in Mercedes right now. I truly, and I know we were talking about this earlier, I think Max will either, I think he'll retire at the end of the regulations in 2025. He'll go off on a high note before they have to change the car and like, Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, and then he's stuck with that through the end of his contract. I truly think that he'll be done in 2025. Yeah, I I think, you know, his current contract is through 2028, which would be, you know, well into the next regulation. But, you know, like you – like. Back thinking back to the beginnings of, of Max's career and, you know, back when he was this really young phenom and wondering where he was going, um, the, you know, Mercedes – was a really, you know, they wanted to get him at Mercedes. Mercedes wanted him, but they had Rosberg and Hamilton. So Max ended up, you know, in the Red Bull family, starting off at Toro Rosso. But Mercedes is not, like, doesn't have the same cachet that it did in 2016. Like, it's not the dominant team. It's not the dominant drive. It is... You know, it would be the worst thing for Max's career. And I, tr- and this is not because I'm not a Mercedes fan, but, you know, leaving Red Bull for Mercedes would be the worst thing for Max's career. And as somebody who is so obsessively driven and focused on success, Max would be miserable if that happened. Yeah. No, he would. He would. Like, I there's, mean, there's, there's to nothing. And Toto work together. But I mean, I don't even know how that would happen. I don't know (laughs) how that would happen. Like the, yeah. And it's, you know, it it would be a devastating move. And like you said about, you know, Lewis, Lewis going to Ferrari and Max potentially moving away from Red Bull are two wildly different, different things that, that cannot, they're apples and oranges and cannot be compared. It's, it's it's Mars and it's France. Um, (laughs) 
Like that's that's how different these situations are. And we love to talk about these rumors and we love to hear these sound bites. Um, but that's like, you know, Max even said, you know, anything could happen. And yeah, that's true. Anything can happen. But at this point, you know, Max was asked today, how can he focus on driving amidst the controversy? And the answer yeah. that he doesn't give is that he literally doesn't give a shit. Like right. he, what, what Max Verstappen loves to do is drive cars really fast. And right now that is what he is able to do. That is what the team is enabling, you know, for him to have. It's not impacting car and team performance. So therefore he doesn't care. And, yeah. you know, everybody wants Max to, to like have an opinion or, you know, be upset about this, but you know, anything that Max would be upset about would be, you know, related to race conditions at this point. Um, he, he, he says that he can like turn it off and obviously it's cause like, it doesn't matter to him. And as long as he's still winning right and I think for Max like this is a job right like like take Lewis for example yeah. like this is his life his life's work is F1 mm-hmm. this is Max's job so like he checks in he checks out and he goes and I don't think all of the controversy and everything and the rumor mill and everybody talking that doesn't affect him because that's his like off time and he doesn't care and he doesn't buy into it because it's not, it's not the him racing. So I think he has a very interesting on and off switch. Let's say, like, I mean, he's what mm-hmm. playing FIFA the night before he's supposed to be racing or qualifying, like up late, just not paying attention, or not not that he's not paying attention, but like not focusing. And like, if you we were to take like what Lewis was doing at the same time. I bet he's studying film. He's looking at stuff. He's, you know, talking with engineers, strategy, X, Y, Z. Again, yeah, wildly different individuals, different perspectives. And Lewis is just one example. But I think Max truly doesn't give a shit, which I think is great. No, no, he, he doesn't. He and like if he's not racing in a car, he's sim racing or he's you know he's got an esports team he's he's got so many other like he's not worried about this and he's even said that he's accomplished everything there is to accomplish as a formula one driver um and he doesn't need you know seven or even eight world championships to break that record for him to feel accomplished in his career he has accomplished everything that was set out to do the moment yost verstappen put him in a go-kart um and And this is just like sticks around because of that like because max doesn't care and he's like i'm just here to drive and like yos is doing the talking that he thinks max should be doing and like trying to really have a handle on his career that's probably it yeah yeah and it's just it's it's unnecessary like you know, I know he has influence, but I don't think it's necessary to acknowledge that because it, you know, this is, this is only happening because of the Christian Horner controversy drama. And so with, you know, so, so Yost feels that he has to say something um, to help Max, but it's not actually helping, but it's also not hurting because Max doesn't actually care. Yeah. I don't know. Oh. And I also would like to point out that the text, the alleged text messages from that email dump that was sent out to the entire paddock and all of F1 and F1 media still has not been authenticated and it's been more than a week. Um, so, and and that's why we, there, there's been very little Christian Horner in the news. I mean, I was watching SportsCenter today and they did have a little bit of, of a segment on on Horner and, and Red Bull and everything. And go off a little bit of a tangent to go off on go off track a little bit it just it makes me feel so weird when formula one pops up on sports center on you know, know weekends where it's not an american race i don't know what it is or why it makes me feel that way but when like i'm just like there's something like that just doesn't make sense about formula one in like just part of the regular news routine. And obviously this isn't a regular story, so they, they're choosing to cover it, but it just, it feels so random. It's like, why is ESPN talking about Formula One? Yeah, no, it is kind of off. It, it feels weird. It's like, why are you talking about this sport? What are you doing? This is yeah, you've been doing. talking about the NFL for the last two hours and now you're going to talk, well, about talk about motor the racing? Shit that happens in the NFL and something like really, really big could happen in F1 and like they don't cover it. And then they'll, yeah. what they pick and choose to cover is so random. 
yeah but. it's it's just it so it was just it was just very interesting to me um do you think we've talked to death in the last what 12 minutes about you know max verstappen yos verstappen and everything going on at red bull yeah but like i just i really 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 want like a documentary on his upbringing because like hearing the stories like if you guys don't know please google max's you know upbringing and the parenting that Yost did because like he dropped him off at a gas station and just left him there because he didn't win a race and I'm pretty like he attacked either Max or so- a mechanic or someone with like a wrench and he allegedly had, like, oh, allegedly I'm so sorry I didn't mean to you know incriminate anybody here um it's wild and Max is just like oh yeah no like he you know punched someone because of this and he's like huh and it's like how is this kid normal and okay and functional? Like, I want to Well, he's him. not. Well, no, but you know what I mean. Like, he could be yes. so far off the cliff. And he is, he's not normal. He's a super freak of an athlete in, a, in the best way. But Gridwalk last week, for example, Martin was like, how are you? And he's like, no, how are you? Like, you know what I mean? He's like a normal Yeah, yeah, yeah guy i guess that's what i'm trying to say behind closed doors who actually knows what happens but i really want a yos max like sit down tell all i think that'd be great (laughs) you you know maybe in like 30 maybe in like 30 years max will write his tell all about about his childhood i think that certain things have to have happened before he can actually you know tell all the stories um but but this is what but yeah (laughs) <laughs> wanting to know the real family <laughs> dynamic of the Verstappens. Keeping up with the Verstappens, I would tune in every week. Can you imagine, like, could you have ever imagined, like, when you when you turned on Drive to Survive on a whim, that we would be here now talking about this and, and spending all, I was, I was, you know, waking up this morning, not even out of bed yet, thinking about what we were going to talk about in today's episode. Like, this, this ain't normal. I don't think this yeah. is normal. No, it's not. It's not. No. But we're not normal either, Catherine. Let's no, we are, we are not. Our our careers in sports did break us very significantly. Yes. Um, okay. Speaking of um, sports, oh, let's let's God. move on to well, let's go back in time a little bit to provide a little bit of context because we the podcast did not exist at the time. Um, so let's go back to Saudi Arabia, twenty twenty three a year ago. Um, Aston Martin was on a hot streak. Fernando Alonso was coming off his first podium in 800 years. Saudi Arabia happens. Fernando Alonso finishes P3, celebrates P3, and then gets a 10-second penalty because he um, he was serving a penalty um, in the pits, uh, and it was deemed after he had gone back out that the penalty was not served properly. So Alonso, at the end of the race, was served another 10-second penalty that dropped him from P3 to P4, advancing George Russell onto the podium following following the podium ceremony. This penalty was due to the fact that um, when Alonzo was serving the penalty, um, mechanics were touching his car, which in the the language with with the the jack. jack. Yeah. And with the language of the rules at the time, it was not clear that what serving a penalty means is that nobody can touch the car. Nothing can touch the car. The car just has to sit stationary untouched for five whole seconds. Um, so because of that questionable language, Aston Martin was able to appeal to the race stewards and get that penalty overturned, giving Fernando Alonso back P3. It was his 99th, po- no, it was his 100th podium of his career. Yeah, it was his 100th. Um, it was like, 100, 99, 100. 99, 100. Um, there's a fun little video of the Mercedes staff putting the trophy in in the car, you know, at, at Brackley and and driving it off to the Aston Martin facility in Silverstone. Um, so it was it was a whole big thing. And then ultimately the um, F, they, they rewrote the rules about how car serving penalties in race, you know, cannot be touched by anything, anyone, no jacks, nothing. Um, which brings us to this week. 
where FIA President Mohammed bin Salayim is under investigation for getting that result overturned in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I'm not surprised that something like this happened with that race result. But at the same time, I know that Aston Martin, like, sent them video, like, they sent the stewards, like, videos and everything of, like, well, what about this one? This was fine. You didn't give them an extra penalty. It's the same exact thing. The language is vague. Right. So I do think Aston Martin did do a good job of, like, challenging it and backing up, like, what they did. However, yeah. yeah. The the FIA president may have also been involved. <laughs> yeah, so so I I definitely think that they were correct to overturn it. The oh, the 100%. issue here is that President Ben Salayim, um should not have allegedly made a phone call to the FIA vice president for sport of the Middle East, who was at the race asking him to to get that overturned. Um, and I think that the real um whistle whistles being blown here in in this allegation that the FIA is investigating um, is that Mohammed bin Salayim may be overstepping in, in his, his position. position. He also allegedly told officials not to certify uh, the circuit in Las Vegas, which ironically enough did end up breaking Carlos Sides' car and in <sighs> FP1 and led to a little bit of controversy. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. If he was calling in to say, like, Vegas is shit, but let's certify it because we can't lose the race. Or if he was like, I don't want, I don't care what Aston Martin does, Fernando Alonso doesn't get P3. Like, that's different. I understand what he's doing is wrong. He is interfering and he's overstepping, but he's not doing it in a way that would threaten the integrity of the sport. You know what I mean? It's not like he's saying, I understand the language isn't clear and I see what Aston Martin's doing, but I don't want Fernando on the podium anymore. So we have to keep George up. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Well, yeah, but no, he he was saying that he wanted Fernando to, he wanted Fernando right, no, to keep I'm say, Right, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right. So I'm saying like, it's not like he's trying to overturn things or not overturn things that would not be right. Right, so right, right. I think it's yeah, the, it's, I don't know. He has a very long track record of overstepping in in certain ways, especially in regards to Formula One, that because Formula One is the you know biggest name in motorsport is incredibly publicized. So all I can imagine that this is going to come up to is basically they're going to give him a slap on the wrist and say, stop talking. Yeah. Which, which is exactly what they did last year when he got into his last controversy. Like the, the FIA is no stranger to controversy. Um, at, and at the same time, like, is this any worse than, you know, anything that happened back in the days of like Bernie Eccleston and Max Mosley? No. Probably not. No, no. I mean, yeah, I think. I know he's under investigation, but I feel like it's a nothing burger because nothing's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. You know, and especially because like you said, you know, Aston Martin provided enough evidence that I think that they would have, you know, I don't think they needed, you know, his his influence to overturn and give Fernando his his podium back. Yeah. No, I don't especially think. because they also waited so long to, you know, call, you know, to to give him that penalty. Like they waited until way after the race, and it's like that is something that can that should have been assessed, you know, as the penalty was being served. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Well, continuing on this, let's talk about Saudi Arabia, but not actually talk about this weekend trend yeah. that we have going on. Um. So. There's been some renditions circulating social media for a new purpose-built track in Saudi for, like, 2027, in the late 2020s, let's say. Um, Yeah. So it's kind of been rumored or alleged that there will be a purpose-built track for Saudi. This is kind of the update of that. Um, Which we haven't gotten an update in years. No. No. And I immediately thought Rainbow Road. <laughs> this is yeah. this is Rainbow Road. We are we are moving into the Mario Kart era of F one, and moving away from Jetta, which I we you don't like Jetta. I don't love Jetta. 
Um, I think it's cool. Do I think it's realistic? No. Does it look super, yes. super dangerous? Absolutely. Yes. So if you haven't seen the renditions, I highly recommend that you look at it. I think we also posted it to our, our story today. But um, turn one is elevated. And when I say elevated, I mean 20 stories above the ground elevated. And there's also, you know, 20 other turns besides t- turn one in there. But um, having a 20 story elevated turn one. What? Yeah. Not happening. It's really giving happening. Rainbow Road. And it so what's, what's interesting road. is, is this track is being designed by a former F1 driver and a um, noted you know, famed track designer. So this isn't like somebody who's just like, oh, wouldn't this be really cool? Like this is somebody who has experience building Formula right. One tracks. It's but at the same time, like it's, it just, it's, it, the pictures just felt so chaotic. And I was just immediately very overwhelmed looking at it. Um, and it's just like, I don't know what to think at this point. I mean, I love it. Let's not get me wrong. Like, I'm obsessed. I love the idea of a rainbow road and, you know, F1. But also, like, alarms are going off in my head. Like, danger, danger. Like, I don't see how you can have a car going top speed up 20 stories. That just doesn't work. Like, what happens if there's a crash? Or we have a Zhou Guan Yu, like, Silverstone event. Wait. And, yeah, you fly. Like, what? No. Are they going to make a tunnel? Is this truly going to be Rainbow Road? Like, what are we doing? Yeah, that's... Yeah, those those are... Just thinking of this, Catherine. I I I agree, and it's like from from a spectator standpoint, how does that work? Like like how how do the fans like? watch from the blade or or anything like that so there's a lot of questions um this is all th- this track is part of what's called the um Kadaya entertainment district district in Riyadh um which is this big massive thing that they started building I think in 2019 um and you know right as of right now I think the the contract for Saudi Arabia in Jeddah specifically which is a street track um is through 2027 so we won't see this until way far away and hopefully logic will come in and apply like a little bit and then they'll remember that safety is paramount in in motorsport as well as cool shit um but it's it's interesting and and i i really don't know what else to say. I've seen some positive responses from a number of F1 drivers. Fernando Alonso posted it to his Instagram today. Valtteri Botas posted it to his Instagram today. Um, so clearly I think some of that is, is like he was told to post that by, you know, you know, people on his team. Um, and I mean, his PR team, not like Aston Martin or, yeah. or, or Sauber. I mean, I think he um, also, like, has an interest and piques their interest as well. Like, having driven yeah. the same tracks for so long. Like, well, I know Vegas is new, but something different, something they've never seen before. It comes to them as a challenge. They're, you know, top-tier competitive athletes. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it'll it'll be interesting to see what this track ultimately does look like when it becomes something to exist. Um, and we will let you know um, in 2027, we guess. Who knows what the calendar will look like in 2027? Yeah. Oh, that said, um, I do think that we're getting closer to re- um, to like not regionalizing the calendar, but like. Um, having more flexibility having in the variety. calendar and and yeah having a little bit more variety which we talked about a few episodes ago um i think it was in in the episode uh, um where we also talked about lewis hamilton waking up choosing violence and turning february 1st into um april fools Emily's um personal hell <laughs> yeah but um so there there are rumors that f1 is in talks to bring back the turkish grand prix um and basically in order to like make these things happen, it would have to make a transformation in the Formula One schedule where some years you go to some races and some years you don't. And you'll probably have like a core amount of races that you go to every year, like, you know, 
Monaco, Australia, Spa, to, to name a few potential, you know, Monza um, would be ones that would stick to the calendar, Silverstone. Um, but then, you know, one year we go to Turkey, one year maybe we go back to Malaysia and Sepang, please. Um, you know, one year we go to South Africa. Um, and so I, I like, I really like the idea of opening up Formula One to going to more different locations than just like the same 24 tracks. Yeah, it expands the fan base too. Like I know we exactly talked about like India maybe coming back, and you know if you expand it to all of these countries, you get more local pull, you get more local buy in, and it's easier I think for some of these smaller countries to host an F one race once every four years versus every single year because hosting yeah. a race every year is a lot. So, like, I know we used to come to Argentina. There was an Argentina Grand Prix a long time ago. Um, And so some of these other countries who used to host Grand Prix, you know, maybe they get a shot again. And we get to see them race in different places. It makes the season exciting because it's not the same races over and over. Um, I I like that idea a lot. I know they've been talking about it specifically for, like, Europe because there's so many European races but yeah. I'd like to see the variety, like, worldwide, globally, with maybe, like, your seven or eight that you go to every single year. Yeah, exactly. And it also would make sense, you know, the, the, the rumors of the Chicago Grand Prix, like, are they really going to bring four Grands Prix to the United States? No. I mean, maybe, but also, you know, we can rotate between Vegas, Miami, um, and, and Chicago. I think that Kota should be a mainstay, but that's just I do because too. I, I think hope that they don't Kota is the Kota. best American race. Yeah, yeah it, it's it. it's one of the best. It's one of the most accessible. Obviously, Miami and Vegas will become more accessible as the years go by, but Kota is just though. like Vegas, probably not. Um, but Kota is just like it's the quintessential American race, and it's also the most accessible to American fans. So yeah. it, it it has an important place on the calendar. Honestly, Mexico City might be more accessible to, to American fans. You're probably not wrong. Um, we'll get there. Yeah, well, eventually. I don't know. I think there's going to be a lot of changes coming in the next few years to schedules, teams, things like that. So it's always exciting to look forward to. Yeah. But with that, should we talk the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix? The 2024 edition the 2024? of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix? 2024 edition? Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. Well, it's our first street circuit of the year. Yeah. That's exciting. Super fast track at Jetta. Um this is one race that Max did not win last year. Checo won Correct. last year. Um Max got second, like we were talking earlier. Fernando ended up in P three. Um but it's just one that we don't love on this podcast. Yeah, it's it's not my favorite track. It is one of the longest tracks on the calendar right behind spa. I don't know what it is that bothers me so much about this track, but there's just something about the racing in Jetta that it's just, it's not as good as racing in other places. And so it's, it's just, yeah, I, I really can't quantify it like specifically. It's just, I don't love it. Yep. But we're here. But we're here. Yeah. All right. Should we get our predictions going? Let us let us get our predictions on. This was hard for me to pick this week. I don't know why. This was this but... to me was kind of like shot in the dark because I have no idea what to expect. Um Yeah, yeah, exactly. This this was very like uh I'm gonna I'm gonna say some words here and we're gonna see what happens. Um, yeah. and it, it, all of, all of, like, all of my predictions come with the caveat of the shrugging emoji, because I really don't know what I'm picking here. <laughs> yeah. So new for this season of the podcast, we are actually keeping track of points so we can make this competitive and we don't have, you know, the out of left field picks that we had last year, maybe. So as a reminder, pole position, we get one point podium. You have to get the full podium in the correct order, Catherine. God damn it, Ferrari. (laughs) I'm still mad about it. P10 is three points. And then we also 
go through our, you know, what would be a big surprise for the weekend and who's going to do a dumb, but let's start off with our poll position. And again, this year, we're not sharing who we're picking for, you know, influence on each other. So Catherine, who do you have for poll? I mean, at this point, it's the continuing of the, I picked Max. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I might like pull a fast one and change this just because I had Carlos, but it's been reported that he's not feeling well and he's sick. Yes. So I'm a little hesitant to do that. So I, I, I had Carlos slash Max, so I'm going to go Max. Um, yeah. Because it was between that... the two of them. And just with Carlos, it literally just came out like an hour before we started recording. It yeah, this little, this influenced – yeah, Car- the news that Carlos is not feeling well did influence my picks for pole and podium. Um, so I'm hopefully he feels better and he continues, you know, being on the on the tear that he's on. Um, but you never know with yeah, you know, know. Th- whatever's you know in the air these days. Um, okay, so with that, we move to podium. So who is your podium for this weekend? So my podium based on Carlos potentially not feeling well is Max um, in P1, Checo in P2, and then I have Charles Leclerc in P3. I think that Ferrari will make him take advantage of Carlos if his illness continues, and we will see that Ferrari ahead of the other. Uh, That pains me. So Mm -hmm. this is, Catherine, the most excruciating thing for me to have to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have Max in P1. I have Checo in P2. He is also the king of the streets after all. I, so fucking <laughs> dumb. Um, and then I have Carlos. I do have Carlos as P3. Okay. Because not to foreshadow too much, but um, Car- Charles will do a dumb this weekend. <laughs> I'm just convinced of it. Did not do well last week. Um, I think he's still going to struggle with his tires and and the setup. So um, that's my dumb. But before we get there, we also pick P10. P10 is the last place on um, the grid where you earn points. You get one point for P10. We award ourselves three points because this one's really hard to predict. Who is your P10 for Jetta? So I think I picked this partially on vibes and partially on the hope that he won't have the same performance as he did last race. So I picked Hulkenberg. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, he won't get tagged on the opening lap and have to be, you know, half a, half a minute behind the, the rest of the field. And that maybe this means that he will, you know, end get up a point. with a point. All right. Honestly, I don't know where this one's coming from, but this, this driver kind of hovered around P10 last week, um, at least for a little bit. I picked Yuki. I hope he just kind of bounces back from his bad week last week and gets a point. Also, we're always, you know, rooting for Team Carbohydrate on this podcast, so I would like to see them get some points this weekend. And maybe not fight each other. And maybe not fight each other. Yeah, so... Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So there's our pole podium and our P10 for for our points, and then two that we just do for fun. Biggest surprise and who's going to do a dumb? Who? What is your biggest surprise of the weekend? My, I think my biggest surprise is that a Williams car will finish in the points. Oh, okay. Based love, based on I their performance the, the, last the week, Williams car. We know it'll be Alex Albon. But, Correct. Um, <laughs> I love that you're giving Logan Sargent like a little bit of credit or not credit, but just you're giving him a little bit of opportunity to fulfill this one. Exactly. Um, My biggest surprise, I'm going to say that Mercedes is going to make a jump this weekend and improve from last weekend. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have a little bit more faith in them than I do. I I know. Well, I mean, that's not hard. They looked pretty good in testing. They looked good in, um, you know, free practice last weekend. And then the race, they just blew up, but not blew up. They just didn't, you know, handle it. Their car well, did I, have some issues, so it wasn't yeah. just driver performance. They had some, right. They had some overheating, and everyone else who was using uh, Mercedes power unit, they also had a few issues. So I'm thinking they- Other than McLaren. 
right other than McLaren. Um, well, who knows? That's what Zach was saying. I don't trust yeah. him. Um, <laughs> we all know how much Emily hates Zach. Um, so I think they're going to take that back and analyze it and improve this weekend. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. So, yeah. All right, Catherine, I told you who's going to do a dumb. Charles is just going to do something. Something's going to happen with him. He's going to DNF or overheat or have issues with tires and just not drive how he should. But um, it is the – we are fully supporters of Team Carlos this season. Um, Clearly. Not Ferrari, just Team Carlos. And so, yeah, Charles is going to do something bad. What about you? Okay. Um, my pick, I, I didn't want to do another week of Alpine is just going to continue destroying itself, especially in light of another senior member of their their team leaving. This one is going to Aston Martin. He's been a senior advisor, you know, at Renault Alpine forever. And now he's going to Aston Martin where he will go back to, to working with Fernando. Um, speaking of Aston Martin, I did pick... Um, Aston Martin and I said that we are going to have another weekend with another iffy Aston Martin strategy yeah is Aston Martin of 2024 the Ferrari of 2023 probably not Ferrari will will definitely have have their moment Ferrari will always be Ferrari. As, as as the Ferrari of of the the strategy yeah well I'm excited to watch again I'm really happy that it's a Saturday race I am liking these Saturday races um, yeah I will say though I will be watching this from a gymnastics meet because the race starts at the same time warm up starts because you will be on a plane. I will be getting there early iPad in hand um, so that I can watch the race coverage while also preparing for one of the biggest gymnastics meets of the season. It'll be fine. I can multitask. Well, I don't know if I'll be on a plane. I think I will have just landed in Dallas. Okay, not bad. So I'll be watching it, like, as I land and as I'm picking up all four of my bags at baggage claim. <laughs> Go team. That's um, fine. And then driving down to New Braunfels. So, yeah. But this – oh, speaking of, Catherine, this is our last podcast of me in Argentina for, like, two months. Oh, my gosh. That's – Oh, my gosh. For those of you who don't – watch this on youtube you just listen to it as a podcast you're really missing out because we do this on video for youtube and um the struggles we have with argentina internet are beyond this world and half the time Catherine just keeps talking because i'm disconnected and then i have to come back but um we get to be without that for a little bit so it'll make podcasting a little bit easier which is i'm excited it'll it'll just be us fighting with our camera equipment just the the forever fight with the cameras. Yes. Ooh, come on, do not disturb. Ooh, must be important. somebody important must be calling. Yeah. Um, anyway, well, let's wrap this up with the uh, <laughs> Catherine's F one fun fact, so that we can get <laughs> to the outro. Off track. Oh, okay. What is your fun fact for us today, Catherine? So first of all, I was looking for F1 fun facts and most of these F1 fun facts that I've been seeing on the internet are boring as hell. Um, They're like, oh, Formula One is, it's called Formula One because it's the peak. I don't care. I want like obscure shit. Like, you you know, send me your obscure fun facts and I'll I'll read them out on the podcast. Um, So this obscure fun fact um, of F1 is rather F1 adjacent and related to a recently retired Formula One driver um, is that the, and, and related to, to the current dominant team, but the first can of Red Bull was sold the same year that Sebastian Vettel was born back in 1987. Oh, it's been around that long. Right. I didn't realize that. Huh. Maybe it hadn't made it across the Atlantic to the United States for, for a really long time. Because Red Bull is an Austrian brand. But on this podcast, we love to not age shame, but just bring up how old Fernando Alonso is. What year was he born? Was he alive for the very first can being sold? (laughs) This is what I want to know. How old is he compared to Sebastian Vettel? I think he's older. Right? Fernando was Fernando Alonso was born in 1981. He was definitely around for the first can of Red Bull. <laughs> Six years old. 
Yes. Oh, also, spe- speaking of age, there was a picture of Zhou Guan Yu in the paddock today that's been floating on around on Instagram with a very oh interesting, God. distinct about hairstyle. Mary. Yeah, yeah. Cameron Diaz in something about Mary with the 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 cowlick up at the front, and I, and I was like, when did something about Mary come out in relation to how old Zhou Guan Yu is. And so I can, uh, I can say that Zhou Guan Yu was born sometime in 1999. It doesn't say when, when on the Wikipedia page, but um, something about Mary came out in 1998. So that movie and that hairstyle is a almost full year older than he is. Wild. It's crazy yes. how old kids are these days. You know what I mean? Like, right. people weren't around for 9-11. Does it, isn't that insane? People weren't around for, yeah. like, Y2K. I, I lived through that. Ourselves, but still. Yeah. Too. This is what happens when you podcast in your 30s. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, on that note, up next, we will have our Saudi Arabia Grand Prix recap, which will come out on Monday. The first podcast we get to record with both of us in the U.S. for a long time, which will be fun. Oh, I'm excited for the first street race. Let me tell you. But that has been our podcast. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.